My name is Jim Westrick. I'm also one of the co-founders of Smart Edge Systems. Uh, I live in Ashland, Oregon. And as Christy alluded to, we have Steve Retzlaff, who's been the principal over at Ashland Middle School for, well, he's been working there about 17 years. Uh, about eight or nine years ago, Steve started a whole switch from the way we had been doing things in education for 100 years to a proficiency-based scoring and reporting. And the results, frankly, have just been remarkable at his school. Uh, I've been an educator for about 30 years in K-12, and the one thing that's always frustrated me is that there are books about everything, and they're always very high level and tell you in very general terms what you should do, but Steve is someone who's actually done it and can give us some concrete advice and some concrete uh, tips on what worked and what didn't work and what he might do differently uh, and things like that. So I'm real excited uh, to help Christy continue this interview today while she finishes up. And I'll let Christy give me a high sign if and when she's ready to jump back in. Uh, many of you sent us questions in advance. Thank you for that. Uh, I had the opportunity to get those questions to Steve yesterday. So he's had a little bit of a chance to prepare. And let's just kick it right off then. We're gonna go right into it because I know people are here because we're looking for some answers uh, from someone who's actually been there and done this and made this change. So we're gonna start kind of right off the top and Steve, we'll just kind of, you know, you gotta start off with a softball question. So let's start you off nice and easy right off the bat. You started this eight or nine years ago. You've got the, the benefit of hindsight. What do you think are the most important things that principals need to consider and really need to be actively thinking about if they're looking at moving to a proficiency-based scoring and reporting system. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks for jumping in. I'm glad you are our plan uh, B and uh, you are ready. And I'm glad we had uh, had an opportunity for you to take part, Jim, give you a part to do. So yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, one of the things I think that's the most important to consider really with kind of any initiative, not just proficiency-based or standards-based reporting, but, you know, we, for us, it was central, was knowing your why. Simon Sinek talks about that in a, a TED Talk that's really good. Uh, know your why. And I think it's one thing to know your why as a leader or an administrator about why you maybe want to make a change or why you want to move to proficiency or standards-based reporting. Um, but it's really, really critical that your staff knows the why as well. Um, at the surface at Ashland Middle School, um, you know, we had been doing traditional letter grades and that system appeared to be working at least for a number of our students. You know, we had students who were getting A's or on the honor roll or those kinds of things. They were performing and doing well. Uh, but when we looked a little deeper into the data, we realized that that letter grade system wasn't really working for all of our students. And then in fact, there were a lot of students that were being left behind. Um, there were students that weren't represented on those honor roll lists or those A student lists. Um, and some of those students came from our English language learners or our students of color or resource special education kids or title students that just weren't represented in the same rate uh, as our other students uh, at the top of those sort of performance uh, metrics. And so uh, we did a lot of reading about traditional grading systems and proficiency-based systems and tried to see what the experts out in the field had to say about these two systems. And uh, actually, I've got a, I do have a quote here that I prepared I'd like to share. Let's see if I can bring this up that I think is really helpful. Uh, and this one comes from, can everybody see that, Jim, Christy? Yes, we can see it. Great. Thanks. Okay, great. So this is from Five Obstacles to Grading Reform from Thomas Gusky. I know a lot of people probably are familiar with uh, Gusky. And uh, he said this, this is actually, I think this article came out in 2011. So, you know, at that time, he was saying one of our oldest traditions in schools is grading and certainly is true now. And that that comes from a belief that grades should serve to differentiate students on the basis of demonstrated talent. Students who show superior talent receive high grades, whereas those who display lesser talent receive lower grades. And although seemingly innocent, the implications of this belief are significant and troubling. Those who enter the profession of education must answer one basic philosophical question. Is my purpose to select talent or to develop it? And so we asked our staff that question, you know, what's your value? What do you believe? Do you think uh, we should just be in the business of sorting and selecting um, talent and students into those different buckets? Uh, or do we feel like uh, and believe that our job is to develop talent and that all students can learn. Uh, and our staff was resounding in answering that question, as you might imagine, that they, they felt like all kids can learn and they wanted to do everything they could to develop that learning or develop that talent with their students. 
And so Gusky goes on to say, well, if your purpose as an educator is to develop talent, then you go about your work differently. First, you clarify what it is you want students to learn and be able to do, and then you do everything possible to ensure that all students learn those things well. If your purpose is to develop talent, this is what you must strive to accomplish. And that really helped us thinking about this uh, quote from Gusky, or this piece from Gusky in this article was really central to shifting uh, our staff and getting everybody on board with the idea that we wanted to do something differently to make sure that all of our students were learning. We believe they could, and we wanted to do everything we could to make sure that all kids were learning and successful. Well, that's that's really interesting. So you just, I love the way you just sat down and posed that to your staff, right? Because when I started as a teacher back in 1990, it was just points and letter grades, and it really was just sorting kids. It was just, well, those are the A kids and those are the C kids, and there wasn't much more about what we think of today about the growth mindset and all kids can learn. Well, that was the easy question, Steve. Let's let's grab the third rail of, of education now because you alluded to letter grades. Uh, and I've heard a lot of different things said about letter grades and proficiency. Some people say, well, you can't have both or they conflict or it doesn't work or this or that. You've been on quite a journey at AMS because I know AMS has used letter grades for decades and currently you're in a different spot. So tell us about that. How do letter grades work with proficiencies or do they work with proficiency scoring? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's a common question. You know, can can letter grades work with proficiency scores or proficiency based grading? Or if we're going to do proficiency, we can't do letter grading. So that's that's a good question to surface, Jim, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, several folks sent that question out to us. Um, you know, for me, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about letter grades is points and percentages, right? Uh, I think of a letter grade as an A and I think a 90%, or I think of a, a student who has a C in the class and they probably have a 70 or a 75% in the class. And really those traditional letter grades are just a collection of points and percentages. That's, that's really the learning currency uh, in a traditional letter grading system. Uh, and and that learning currency that focused on points and percentages and categorizing kids into these A, B, C, D, and F students um, really just is feeds into that sort and select mindset of education or what we've done a lot historically that Gusky was talking about in education. And that system works pretty well. You get some students who are A students and you think, well, maybe these students need to be tested for TAG and or these are our accelerated learners or um, we're going to let's level our math class and we'll put our A students in this class and our C and D students in this class. Um, and really, we're just sorting and selecting students into high or, you know, low level students. And it starts as early as elementary school, right? I mean, you know, I think when I was in elementary school, they had bluebirds and robins. And, you know, when you hear those terms initially, you might say, well, I don't know which group the bluebirds or the robins is the high or low group. But you know what? The kids in those groups, they know they know if they're in the high group or the low Absolutely. group and they start to see themselves and think of themselves as a, as a good student or a bad student. So, you know, what we really started to think and feel was that the letter grade system traditionally based upon points and percentages, when that's your currency behind your letter grades, that's really counterproductive to this belief or value uh, in thinking that all students can learn and that our job is to make sure that all students can learn or that we're going to develop that talent. Um, Kathy Vatterot uh, has a book that she wrote called Rethinking Grading. Let's see if I can show you. Um, I want to share a quote from her uh, book, if I can. And Steve, while you're pulling that up, I'll make a quick plug that we did receive many questions in advance from you, and thank you for that. You're more than welcome right now. If something comes up or you've just been thinking about something, please put a question in the Q&A. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen with a little question mark. Looks like a little cartoon. Uh, speaker tag there and a question mark. Click that. Ask us a question in the Q and A, and we'll take as many as we can during this time. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Jim. So I don't know if people can see this, but this is Kathy's book, Rethinking, Rethinking Grading, and uh, she says in her book, grades don't equate with performance on standardized tests. Some students who were compliant and hard workers got good grades. Some students tested well but received poor grades because of missing assignments, late work, or bad behavior. And we came to realize that often grades don't reflect proficiency in learning at all. Um, so Kathy really, her whole book is really examining traditional letter grades, that points and percentage learning currency and how that doesn't really reflect student learning. And uh, Joe Feldman in his book, Grading for Equity, uh, kind of picks up where Kathy left off, I think, with her book and saying that this system doesn't work. 
And Feldman starts to say, well, grading can work. It's not grading, not the letter grades themselves that are the problem. It's really the currency behind those letter grades, those that traditional points and percentage where kids are chasing points or chasing percentages um, and focusing on that, that is the problem. And he says that if we change the way we um, uh, go about our, gr our work grading students, grades can clearly and more objectively describe what students know and can do. And that grading practices actually can encourage students not to cheat, but to learn, to persevere, to fail, uh, to persevere when they fail and not lose hope and to take more ownership and agency of their achievement. Um, the power of these approaches can be especially transformative for struggling students. Um, students who have been beaten down year after year by a punishing grading system of negative feedback and unredeemable failure. We can think about some of those students, right? Those are the students who didn't get it the first time. Maybe they didn't have trouble getting their, all their assignments in. They got some zeros and they start getting seeing their grades drop um, because they didn't have something in on time or they didn't um, understand a concept the first time. Um, and when teachers go about changing their grading system, uh, and thinking about something Feldman talks about using rubrics, for example, or more of a proficiency model. And when we do make those kinds of changes, uh, when teachers do that, students will take ownership and responsibility over their learning and would be intrinsically motivated to succeed and would be excited about learning. So that's a big uh, piece for us that we found um, happening for us at AMS. When we started moving away from points and percentages and moving towards proficiency-based grading, and we used rubrics, for example, I'm hoping to be able to talk and share a little bit about that later. I know we have some questions that'll help us maybe show some of that. What happened at our school was that students stopped going up to their teachers and saying, hey, I need 10 more points so I can get my grade up to a 90 percent. Or can I get some extra credit uh, for something? You know, and that's that situation where a teacher might look around the classroom and say, well, yeah, you can get extra credit. I'll give you five points if you pick up all the trash in the classroom and throw it away for me. And that has nothing to do with the science content that the teacher's teaching, but the student is really after those points. And so the teacher finds a way to give them those points so that they can uh, raise their grade up to that 90% mark. And now, instead of doing that, students at Ashland Middle School will go up to their teacher and they'll say, I need to rewrite the introduction to my argumentative essay. I wasn't proficient on it the first time and I wanna rewrite it so I can, I can get to proficient. And so they start talking about skills and knowledge now instead of points and percentages. And that becomes the real focus of the learning for both the teachers and the students. And that's what's been really, really exciting for us at Ashland Middle School. Well, that's really interesting to say that because you gave me a little head fake there. You started off and I thought you were going to talk about letter grades not working. But what I hear you saying is that letter there's nothing wrong with letter grades. The problem is how we calculate those grades because that's what incentivizes or motivates. I mean, kids work, right? I remember as a teacher, kids would come all the time and they would ask you, how can I get 10 more points? How can I get points? Is that going to be on the test? And teachers typically, I remember this, we get very frustrated. Oh, they're grade grubbers, right? They're this, why are they always asking? And at one point I said, when I was an administrator later in my career saying, well, they're just playing the game by the rules that we've created. If we create a game with the rules that say you get 10 points for bringing in cans of soup for the food drive, then that's what they'll do to get a better score in my chemistry class. Versus if you set up your grading to say, to get an A, you need to show proficiency in these six things. Now we're aligning the incentives with that. So the letter grades are not a problem per se. It's just a problem in, in what we're, how we're calculating them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's how we see Excellent. it for sure. That there's nothing wrong with letter grades inherently. It's really the currency behind those grades. Yeah. Right. And it sounds like that's what you've seen is this cultural shift um, in your school. Uh, you know, you've told me before at conferences, you know, kids, instead of saying like, what can I do for extra credit saying, what can I do to show you? That I'm proficient in this. I love uh, the yep. books you, you recommend. You talk about Kathy Batterot. I've got her book right here. And I've got to say, I recommend the book. It's very concise, it's very short. And let me tell you, for educators like us, look at how thin it is. We could get this read in <laughs> half an hour. And yet, it really is great because it just gets right to the nitty gritty of everything. We do have a question. Um, someone had asked, you know, you mentioned Kathy Batterot's book, you mentioned Feldman. Do you have other people? What other resources might they be looking at? Uh, in terms of helping them moving forward after today? Yeah, there's a number of different authors and experts in the field uh, that we read and reviewed and talked with our staff about. We've already talked about Gusky and Feldman and Kathy Vetteret, of course. 
Um, Rick Stiggins wrote The Perfect Assessment System is a really valuable book in thinking about a transformation like this. Rick Warmly has written a number of articles and books about averaging grades and promoting proficiency and standards-based grading. Laura McKenna uh, has a great article called Will Letter Grades Survive that was really power powerful for our staff. And John Hattie's Visible Learning has really uh, leaned into some of the values that we have found through this work, and it, as well as Dylan Williams. Uh, his Keeping Learning on Track, which really focuses on feedback and the role of feedback in learning. Um, so all of these authors, I think, are really good ones for folks to explore and read and learn about if they're thinking about or doing this kind of work and share it with their staff as well, for sure. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, Rick Stiggins is on this list. And uh, my associate principal and I, about seven years ago, we were able to go to a conference out in Maine and present. And Rick Stiggins was there and he was the keynote speaker. And I felt really honored because, and maybe lucky because he, he finished his keynote speaker and we were presenting right afterwards. So we had seen his keynote, we rushed into our room and started presenting. And just a few minutes into the presentation, he came in and sat down. So that was kind of an intense experience to have someone like that come in and listen to you try and explain what you're doing. Um, but <laughs> what I was really excited about and surprised about was that at the end, he came up to us and he said, you know what, this is what you're doing at your school is really what I'm advocating for in this book, uh, The Perfect Assessment System. And uh, in his book, Stiggins talks about in The Perfect Assessment System, the meaning of academic success is always clear to all individually and collectively. That was a big piece for us, that uh, the exercises and scoring schemes can accurately and representatively reflect the learning targets actually being made. And in a perfect system, we link our assessment practices to student motivation in constructive ways that keeps all students believing success is within reach if they keep striving. And this is one of my favorite sort of uh, pieces that, from his book that he says, when we do this, if we have a, an assessment system like this, then students' response to assessment results become, I understand these results, I know what I need to do next, I'm okay, and I choose to keep trying. And this was really, really powerful because we had just completed a survey with our students as I think three years into our work and 93% of our students said the rubrics help me understand what the teacher wants me to do on an assignment. And uh, 91 of the students said that they understand why I got the score I did on an assignment and 85% of the students said I know what to do if I'm not yet proficient on an assignment or test. So those uh, results from the surveys just matched up so well with these four pieces that he said would happen if you had a good assessment system or the perfect assessment system. So I don't know if it's perfect or not, but it certainly was nice to have that validation from uh, the students uh, come in and line up with what uh, Rick was highlighting and prioritizing in his book. Well, Steve, those survey results are so powerful because we've all heard the phrase, and we talked about this, I think Christy talked about this with you in the first interview about guess for success and students saying, well, I wonder what's gonna be on the test, or I don't know what I did wrong, or how many times have students called the test random? Like, oh, they, they didn't really. And there's never an occasion where they should have to guess what the assessment is like, right? We don't, yeah. we don't make kids practice driving in a golf cart and then say, you can't really practice in a car until your driver's test on the day of your test, because that would somehow be teaching to the test. The key is you're teaching the skills and they know what those skills are and they know how to get there, right? Um, so the question, one more question that came in that I'm really excited about came in uh, from one of our attendees, I think yesterday, says, you know, now that you've looked back, you've got the, the benefit of hindsight for the last eight or nine years. Is there, is there one thing or maybe two things that you could say actually were, were critical or pivotal in making your initiative at AMS the success that it is versus maybe, you know, going a different direction? Because we've all experienced initiatives at schools that either start up and go nowhere or don't even really start up. Or if you're mm -hmm. like the schools I've taught in, right, we just say we're doing it and we're not really doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But yours, you're there, you practiced it. It's been in place for years. Is there something the last couple of years that you think really was pivotal to make that difference? Well, yeah, I really like this question too, Jim. I'm glad we put this in because um, there's a number of things that I think are really, really important. Um, and some of them are just general things that are important in any kind of change initiative, right? Um, for us, it was really important that we published a multi-year timeline um, and had a really clear plan defined for our staff that they understood where we were going, how far and what progress we were going to make each year, and then we would come back and revisit that timeline and see how much progress we made. We'd make adjustments, and then we'd republish the timeline, and that really helped our staff understand, one, we weren't going to rush this work. We were going to take our time and do it right. We were committed to it, and it was a long-term goal. 
And I think that really went a long way to helping staff understand that we were going to do everything we could to make it work. And I Steve, think having I'll that research, we talked because I think that part you just said is really powerful because maybe I've just taught in a lot of dysfunctional schools over the last 30 years, but I know that a lot of times when something starts, you'll have teachers that just kind of wait it out because they think this too shall pass and in a couple of years it'll, but when you publish something like that and say, this is our plan and it's a multi-year plan. And, and then next year you come back and say, okay, we're going to revise the plan because this happened. Teachers know from the get-go and your whole staff that this isn't just a flash in the pan. This is something that you're committed to. Yeah, yeah. Nope, that's right, Jim. And, uh, and you know, again, the research is really critical. So we talked about having that research and making sure that research is available and making sure that people know where to find it um, and that you can come back to it. That's really, really critical. Um, having time for professional development for the teachers and tools to support that professional development, particularly in writing rubrics, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, that was really critical. And then having that strong, ongoing, you know, almost repetitive uh, communication to the stakeholders that was available. We would have talking points for our teachers when they went into conferences that would explain this transformation, how the system was working. We didn't want our teachers to be in a situation where a parent asked them a question. And they said, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that. So we made sure that the teachers had all the um, really common uh, Q&A questions and those talking points available. And then we would send out information with each uh, report card at the end of the term. Um, we would do parent meetings at the beginning, particularly with sixth grade parents to really orient them to the system and help them understand because that they were transitioning into the school. So those, all of those things are just, I think, generally important regardless of whatever your change initiative is. But for us, the two things that were probably the most important that really made the difference for us was the development of um, standards-based essential learnings, we call them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second was how to make this work doable for teachers. And I saw, you know, someone asked this question, you know, to please talk about how the workload uh, was transformative for the teachers. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But those are two things that really did make a huge, huge difference for us. Um, and I wanna show you uh, a couple more slides if I can. So rubrics, I mentioned that was a big part of it was, you know, we've, we've heard Gusky and others talk about how important it is to be clear and explicit about what it is you want kids to learn. And that that's what we do if we want to develop talent. Uh, we, we clarify what it is we want kids to learn and we make sure they know what it is and then we do everything we can to support them. Uh, so we chose to do this through rubrics. And what we found was that there were a lot of problems with traditional rubrics that traditional rubrics, you know, rubrics are not new. I have a rubric that I get evaluated on by my superintendent. I use rubrics with teachers for observations. Um, if you write a grant, you oftentimes there's a rubric for that. There's just rubrics everywhere. But what we found and what we saw both in those rubrics and with some of our initial drafts of rubrics is that the language was often really vague, pretty general and subjective, something that people could kind of debate or maybe weren't really sure what, what the teacher was wanting or expecting. And so this is an example of some of that subjective language just to kind of remind people, and I think it'll look familiar, but you see stuff like content is mostly accurate and consistently clear. Content is somewhat accurate and fairly clear. Content is somewhat vague or is only partially clear. So these are examples of that subjective language that's really common. It's just, it's not uncommon. And the teacher kind of has an idea of what they mean. They, they kind of go with this, I know it when I see it. Well, the problem with that is that the teacher is holding all the knowledge of what it is they want the students to do and produce. Uh, if they're waiting for this, I know it when I see it. And if we want to develop talent, we believe all kids can learn. We want to make sure that we're really clear and transparent uh, with our expectations for kids. So we started moving into what we called rubrics 2.0. And that was when we really challenged our staff to write transparent and explicit rubrics that had three, we just went with three distinct levels of learning. Proficient was the level that we wanted all of our students to be able to achieve if they were, you know, the beneficiaries of the classroom instruction from the teacher. And then make sure that the, the um, expectations are really clearly defined at each of those levels. That was, uh, that was what we asked our teachers to do. And you won't be able to make out the language on this rubric, and that's okay. I don't want you to worry about that right now. But just to orient you to some of these terms I've already started to use and I might use again. Um, an essential learning is what we called power standards. A lot of people call them power standards. That's at the top. That was always at the top of the rubric, and that was a standards-based um, essential learning or power standard. And we asked our teachers, you know, which of those standards are the most important that you want to make sure all of your kids in class, if they could only learn five things, let's say, what are those five things you want to make sure every single student knows how to do that they're proficient in, that's going to have the most leverage, the most endurance, and the most readiness for them as far as preparing them for um, 
the other content areas, the next unit or the next grade level, those kinds of things. And then Do down you, on the left hand side. Mm -hmm. Did did individual teachers each make their own rubric for all their classes or or how did that work? How did you come up with this? Was each teacher? We'll get to own? that, Jim. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, that's okay. Just want to orient everybody real quick. So the supportive learnings come down the left side here, and these are those discrete skills that make up this overarching essential learning. So you know those standards are encompass a lot of skills. And um, when our teachers started putting together or prioritizing those standards, they still encompassed a lot of skills. So we we had to break those down into discrete those dis separate discrete skills. This one has five, for example. And then the supportive learning language is what we call the language within the rubric. And that was the part that was we wanted to make sure was really clear and explicit. And we had three levels, mastery, proficient, and not yet proficient on our rubrics. And then we had some tools that we gave uh, our uh, teachers to help them with this. We built a rubric for rubrics. And uh, this tool is really helpful for teachers uh, in prioritizing, and identifying which of the standards they wanted to build an essential learning or standards-based rubric with and how to go about making sure that their language, their supportive learning language was explicit and clear and student friendly and those kinds of things. And then we also developed another document called the rubric do's and don'ts. And it really highlighted a lot of the common mistakes we were seeing where um, teachers were maybe using uh, descriptors that were subjective and we really wanted them to use language that's clear, objective, not arguable or debatable or open to interpretation and some examples of that. So the common sort of missteps that were happening with rubrics. Uh, I'm happy to share those tools if folks are interested in those. And so what we found is that when teachers were doing and building these rubrics, they had an efficient and effective tool that they could use to make an assignment rubric. So this is an important piece, and I'm going to show this in a second, um, that they would take their overarching uh, uh, supportive lear or essential learning rubric, their standards-based rubric, and then use parts of that to build assignment rubrics or scoring guides uh, for their students. And then the expectations and the feedback were really transparent and easy for kids to see and find. And then it allowed them to really easily reinforce important skills and knowledge they wanted their kids to learn. Um, so that was one part. One of the things that I would say was really important was making sure that those that are that we were able to build really robust, uh, clear and transparent rubrics. And then the second thing that made a huge difference for us, because our teachers were saying, well, this is a lot of work. You know, I've got my uh, essential learning standards based rubrics. Uh, but I need a way to take those rubrics and create assignment rubrics. So they were having to cut and paste and pull um, different supportive learnings out of their standards-based rubrics and putting them together into assignment rubrics and then make copies of those and hand them out and then score them and then re-enter them into a, a, another system. And so we tried for a long time to do this. Well, not for a long time, but for a year, which is a long time, uh, to try and do this with the, the existing informa student information system that we had but that system really wasn't designed for proficiency-based grading. It was really designed for a points and percentage system and a traditional grading approach. So we wanted to do something different. We wanted to make this doable for our teachers and we knew we needed a better tool. So we started to work on what now we call smart score and a teacher, this is the smart score landing page. I think, can everybody see that Jim? Yes, I was muted. Sorry, we can all great. see that great. Great, no problem. In. So on that page, the teacher can go in. This is a sixth grade language arts teacher, and they can go in to their to smart score and they can find all of their essential learning rubrics here, those standards based rubrics. Now, the first rubric at Ashland Middle School is always um, a student habits rubric, what we call student habits rubric. And these rubrics are really um, focused on those specific skills or student skills that we want kids to have that help them be successful students. They're not necessarily related to the content area, right? So, you know, this rubric talks about activating self-learning, uh, being a respectful member of the community, participating in the class, meeting due dates, those kinds of things. Um, but below that, you'll see the first standards-based essential learning rubric for the sixth grade. And this is something that they, they actually piece together a few standards into this essential learning, and that is identify and define the elements of plot structure in a story and differentiate between major and minor elements. And then they broke that down and defined what those things, what those discrete skills were that they were looking for. And then they have another rubric that's about writing a summary of text using main events and supporting details. And similarly, it's broken down into three uh, discrete skills that they're looking for. And then read, understand, and interact with literature. And they have uh, six skills there that they're focused on. And then develop and strengthen the writing process. And I think there's one more, yep, cite evidence from the text to support a claim. So those are the standards that they prioritize, they built their rubrics on, 
and they have them all here. And when they want to make an assignment rubric or put together a scoring guide, they come to this page and they would say, let's say, well, I want to make sure that this is, I want to give some the kids some feedback about getting this in on time. So I'm going to put meet due dates down. And this one's going to be on identifying the main uh, plot events. And I want to make sure students are using their own words in this work. And let's have them make sure they're doing some editing and focusing on conventions in the writing that they're going to do. And those are the skills that I'm going to put into this assignment rubric. So then I hit the next step. And now the teachers have their assignment rubric. It's built for them. They can enter a title in here at the bottom of the assignment rubric. They can enter some expected components. Those are those non standards based um, things that they want to make sure the students do. So maybe maybe let's say they want one page typed from a student as proficient and maybe two pages typed is going to be considered the mastery level on the expected components. And if it's under a page, it's not yet proficient. So they could enter that information down here in these text boxes. And uh, when they want to then score that rubric, they can go to their feedback page and you'll see here's the main plot events assignment and it has those different supportive learnings all included in the assignment and the expected components. And when they want to go to score it, they just simply click this here and they choose the student from their list. And now they have the rubric and the student work in front of them. And they can say, yep, they identified the main plot events and distinguished from the subplots. Um, they use their own words, but they use too many description words, things like a lot, stuff, things, cool. You know, they didn't hit the proficient level there, but they were proficient on these other things. And they can go on to the next student in the list or jump down to another student, however they want to do it. And in the scoring guide, they'll see those scores represented here. So what's really nice about this system is that sorry i feel like i have to close this i ran into this before our students now are really living in this space so this is what they think about and they look at and they have access to this all the time and this is their student student learning snapshot so from the student learning snapshot a student can quickly see oh i'm doing pretty well i've got a, a you know this student has a fair number of masteries they have a lot of proficiency um, they're on the honor roll and they don't have any missing assignments. So this is a student who's doing really quite well right now. But they do have three things that they're not yet proficient in. And if they wanted to, they can click on this, the student or the parent, and they can see, oh, I'm not proficient on organizing and showing my reasoning in math. And if they want to know and look and see, well, what do I need to do to improve on that? They can click on the math class. They can see a list of all the assignments that they've done. They can come down to the one where they see organize, show reasoning, and I got a not yet proficient on this. I can click on that block test and then I can come down here and I can see, oh, I was I the path to the work was organized. I the work leads to an identified answer, but I forgot to label my tables and graphs and my math words and symbols weren't used correctly. So I have that really specific feedback about what I need to do to improve as a student. I can look at the proficient side if I want to understand where I need to go. And that's been a really significant game changer for us. You know, like I said, what we found now is that our our students are talking about skills and knowledge instead of points and proficient or points and percentages right um, because they can go in and they can see how they're doing on an assignment and what it is that they need to do to improve um, that was really really revolutionary i want to do want to show one more thing jim if i can sure uh, we've got a couple of great the, questions from our attendees pull it back up yeah, sorry. There was one more thing I wanted to show everybody here if I can. So I'm pulling that up, the, the thing that struck me, one of the really powerful things for all of you Ken O'Connor fans out there is how your the use of rubrics has separated his three P's, right? Separates performance from process. Process, right? The things the kids that we feel should need to be doing to be successful. And we want to be really clear that those are important things, things like participation and doing your homework, those are important and those need to be reported to parents and, and give that feedback to kids, but this lets you separate the process from what the student is actually demonstrating so we don't conflate the two. So we don't say, well, you did all your homework mm -hmm. and showed up to class on time, so you ended up with you know great scores, even though you don't really understand the material. I love the fact that it pulls those two apart and gives better information. Yeah, um, this is one of the things I wanted to highlight, Jim. This that's really helpful we found that these graphs up here at the top are for the teachers so they can look and see which of these different discrete skills have i assessed so far if it's red it means they haven't yet assessed it uh, if it's yellow they've assessed it one or two times 
And if it's green, they've assessed it three times or more. And this is a really helpful tool to keep that at the forefront for the teachers so they can make sure that they are progressing through all of their discrete skills from those um, essential learning rubrics that they want to assess and give kids feedback on. And then I also wanted to show you, this was really revolutionary um, for us. Um, when we started to move into proficiency only, some parents were saying, you know, without letter grades, I can't tell when my student is not training in their homework. You know, I used to be able to see they that they their score went for their grade went from a B to a C or a D or something like that because they didn't turn in an assignment. And they got a zero and I need a way to know that they're missing their work. Um, this is how we tried to answer and respond to that. So you can see this student here has a red bar in language arts, and that means that they have missing assignments in language arts. And over here is the three, which tells us they have three assignments missing in language arts. All of their different classes are listed down here so you can quickly go through and see. Uh, which classes have missing assignments, but as a parent or a homeroom teacher, our homeroom teachers love this, they, they can click on this link and open up and create a list that they can then print out for their student of all the missing assignments. So that student knows exactly what it is that they need to do or what needs to be turned in. And this was really revolutionary uh, for us as well in helping um, parents understand which assignments were missing, helping the homeroom teachers or the case managers know which assignments were missing, helping students know and remember which assignments were missing and so that they could focus on getting that work done and work completed. Um, each week we send out, Smart Ed Systems has a way to send out an email to parents and it directly links to their students missing an incomplete assignment list so that parents can get that information. We let them know, hey, your student has this many missing assignments, please have them pick up their work. We send that email out on, on Wednesdays and we say have them pick up their work tomorrow on Thursdays or Friday so they have it for the weekend. Um, and parents do really appreciate that. We want They want to partner with us. Most parents really do want their kids to be successful and they want to figure out how they can support their kids uh, in their That's learning. Right. And they, they've really appreciated that communication. That's really interesting. I think you touched upon another one about how serious are we about having parents be our partners in the education process. I think some schools pay a lot of lip service to that and they'd really be left rather be left alone. Uh, but this really invites parents to come in. My favorite line with a parent who at another school started work on this and he said to me, listen, I just need to know if I can let my kid play video games this weekend, right? And you know, one of the answers, well, there are many ways you could do that. I mean, a letter grade is a very blunt instrument to do that if it's not aligned to performance, but using what you just showed, they could look and say, great, if you have no missing assignments, you can play video games. Or if you have greater than 85% proficiency, you can play video, right? A lot of different things parents can do around that. The other thing that I found powerful is that that focus on missing assignments, because when I started as a teacher, certainly, right, with just points and, and, a, and a spreadsheet, even before they had grade book programs, well, student didn't do an assignment, they got a zero, we moved on. And it kind of changes the whole focus. The focus is now, well, if it's important enough where I'm going to assign it and grade it because I truly feel it's going to help you learn, then you really need to do it. And we're not just going to let you get away with a zero and fade in and be invisible. It's going to show up as a big red M. You're going to see it. And it's not done until it's done. And I, I like that a lot because it also underscores the professionalism of our teaching staff. Like, you know, we're not throwing out work just because we're bored on a Tuesday night and would rather grade papers. We're, we're assigning these things because it really is important. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, we've got a couple of great no, questions. Right. I want to get into it and make sure you have a chance to answer it. Um, the first one um, that came up in our Q&A here. I think it's really interesting because I know you've seen some movement here and they'd like to know how how do you measure this tool against being culturally responsive and equitable? Is this any part of that at mm -hmm. all? Is it separate? Does it does it play into it in any way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, let me pull up a couple of slides actually that um, we were really excited about. Because I think share. you've measured this while you're pulling this up. I think you have yeah. done some data analysis to look at yeah. this, right? And specifically compared yeah, to how we did. their scores in Smart Score would be predictive, maybe of their their work on the Smarter Balanced. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. What we did is we, you know, we're not, you know, we're not big fans of standardized assessments or Smarter Balanced or anything like that. But it is an assessment tool that is currently used and that we, you know, our school gets evaluated on how, how effective are we in supporting our students and making sure students are learning as per their results on their Smarter Balanced scores. And so we wanted to check and see how, um, how the proficiency work was working in that way. And the, we started by taking a look at a, a group of seventh grade math students. So this is a seventh grade math cohort 
and we took and placed all of their letter grades. This is when we were doing proficiency scores and letter grades at the same time. And the proficiency scores weren't at, quite yet represented in the same way through the letter grades. Letter grades were still kind of traditionally based upon points and percentages, and we were reporting out separately whether or not students were proficient on these skills. So our teachers had developed, you know, I think there were six or seven math rubrics with again, you know, five, six different supportive learnings for many of those probably 40 or 50 total supportive learnings that they received scores on. Uh, but this graph shows their grades. You can see there's three students that had D's in seventh grade math. There were two students that had A pluses uh, in seventh grade math. And then these lines right here represent the um, meets mark right here for smarter balance in seventh grade. And then above this line is exceeds. So what we noticed right away was that there were a lot of students with C's, C pluses, B minuses, B's, uh, even B pluses and A minuses that did not meet on the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And so we were realizing it made it really clear that those letter grades were not really predictors of success. And, you know, the problem that we had with it was that reasonably apparent, if, if a student came home or a parent saw, oh, my student has an A minus or a B plus or a B, uh, or even a C plus or a C in math, I think they would reasonably expect that that would mean their student is going to meet on this standardized assessment of seventh grade math. Uh, but clearly that was not happening for many, many students who were receiving those grades. And we know there's a lot of reasons for that. Those grades included uh, and were really driven by points and percentages and didn't always include those skills or knowledge. So then we wanted to, to find a way to um, put together a similar graph and analyze our proficiency scores against that assessment. And so this, it sort of explains how we went about doing it. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm happy to explain it if anybody wants more information. But this is what the graph looked like when we took our proficiency scores and we assigned them some values so that we could put them onto a graph. And over here on this end, you have students at 100% proficient. Each of these dots, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven students that were 100% um, that were 100 on this uh, proficiency scores, which means that they were mastery level on everything. And in the middle of the graph, right around this line, is that 50% mark. And this is where those students maybe were proficient on everything, or they had some proficiency and some masteries and some not yet proficiency, but they came in about 50% uh, on, that, on that scale. And what we found was that 95% of the students who scored above this 50% mark were meeting or exceeding on Smarter Balanced. And so then we did want to dive a little deeper into that and see what was happening with uh, some of our other groups of students. So we looked at our title students, our economically disadvantaged students, and we compared them to everyone else in seventh grade. And we found the same thing. Once they reached this 50 percent threshold, they were overwhelmingly meeting or exceeding. It was more than 95 percent of them meeting or exceeding. And when we took a look at our students of color and we compared those students to our white students, we saw a similar uh, outcome that once they reached this 50 percent threshold, the majority of those students were meeting or exceeding. So we found and we came away to believe that this would um, help us close those opportunity gaps if we could get all of our students to that 50% threshold uh, of proficiency based upon that formula that we put together to, for the graph. So what we started doing is really looking at our students who were not proficient, not meeting on Smarter Balance, and then targeting those students with differentiated instruction to build their skills and get them up to proficient in those supportive learnings that the teachers had identified and identified and, and defined. And um, once we get them there, we see those students meet or exceed on Smarter Balance. Um, and coming out of the pandemic, it was really interesting. You know, I think I read, it seems like almost all states, understandably, we had learning loss, right? We all had learning loss coming out of the pandemic. It turns out it does matter if kids go to school and if kids are in school. And who um, yeah, who knew? And before the pandemic, um, at Ashland Middle School, about 70% of our kids, for example, were meeting or exceeding on um, ELA, Smarter Balanced Assessment, compared to 54% of the state. Um, coming out of the pandemic last year, we, all, we did have a decline. We dropped to 69%, so it wasn't too bad, but we did have a decline uh, where 69% of our students were meeting or exceeding, um, but the state dropped from 54% to 44%. So we ended up widening our performance gap on the state where we were outperforming the state by 16% before the pandemic. And now we're outperforming the state by 25%. Uh, 
uh, coming out of the pandemic. And we feel that this uh, having these really clearly defined expectations, learning expectations for our kids is the difference maker for us in recovering more quickly as we're emerging from the pandemic. So we're really, really excited about um, continuing this work and making sure that kids know what it is we expect from them, making it really easy for them to understand what a teacher uh, wants them to do, and then giving them really good, quick, concrete feedback through scored rubrics uh, and through Smart Score and, and, and the system there so that students can know what they need to do to improve. So Steve, there are a couple of things you said that really resonated and that that I think are really important. One, I, I think in terms of the pandemic, not only were kids focused, but teachers, because they were in this practice of focusing on the performance and having objective ways to assess and really knowing what's important for their class, they had that going in the pandemic. So even I, I think your teachers were more focused as well. And there wasn't all this, you know, we're all trying to do, especially I know in some schools, this this kind of whiplash of, oh my gosh, you know, how can I make sure that, you know, I used to give homework every night, I used to do this, I used to do that. The other part I thought, um, you know, what was really neat, you looked at the, at the performance there. And I think a lot of that is because of, again, those rubrics, right? When we're leveling the playing field with kids that we typically think of as at risk or underserved populations, when you pull out some of those things that in the past we would ding them for, right? Because typically a lot mm -hmm. of those kids, um, they correlate with families that don't have the same support at home. Maybe parents are working two jobs. They don't have a quiet place to work, all those types of things. And when you remove that and report on it separately, then you can show these kids really are performing and it's leveling the playing field. And I think you said that also changes their attitude because these same kids who didn't think they were A students because they weren't A students in the way that we had chosen to define that grade are looking at the rubrics going, well, yeah, but I can do this and I can get mastery in this and I get mastery in that. And it's changing even how they see themselves, it seems. Yeah, that's right, Jim. That, you know, we talked about some of those survey results that we had. That was a survey question. One of the questions we had on our survey with students, we, you know, we wanted to be able to look at those students who didn't think of themselves as A students. So we had a question of, you know, what kind of student are you under a traditional letter grade system? And kids would self-identify, I'm an A student, or I'm a C student, or I'm a, you know, a D student, or whatever the case might be. And then we had a question about whether or not they felt like they could reach uh, mastery or proficient um, on their rubrics. and it was remarkable because the overwhelming majority, I mean, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was in the 80% high 80 percentile of the students who identified themselves as D students or F students, they said they knew or they could uh, reach proficiency. So they started to see themselves different um, as capable learners, I think for the first time. Um, that, wow. you know, that points and percentage currency system uh, and game that was going on that they didn't really know how to play or they didn't know how to be successful in. The A students um, knew how to play it. But wasn't working for them. Yeah, uh, was really changing the way they started to see themselves as learners. So that was that was really, really exciting and really validating for us that we felt really good about um, hearing that from our kids, yeah. Right, oh, that's great. Well, we have got another great question from one of our attendees and I'm sure a lot of us are thinking this as well, all of us who are administrators. Anytime you want to do anything like this or anything close to it, it has a cost, not only in time, you know, and money and things like that. And so a big question is, where do you find the time? Because there you talk about generating essential learning rubrics and then doing some training and having these conversations. How did you carve out time? And what would you recommend for attendees here? Um, because we all have a million things on our plate. There always seems to be something urgent we have to do. How do you make sure and carve out the time to make sure that that happens? Well, I think this is about, you know, prioritizing your focus, right? Narrowing your focus. Um, I feel like in education, there's a lot of different initiatives that come up, a lot of different, um, you know, expectations from the district office. And I know there might be some folks from the district office joining us. So no offense to those folks at the district office, but, you know, they have their own, um, you know, guidance and pressure to do certain things. But what we really focused, focused on at Ashland Middle School was trying to shelter our teachers as much as possible from those other things and really narrowing our focus into this work and then providing them that time, like I mentioned earlier, for them to have that sheltered professional development. We would, um, we would actually work with our language arts PLC, for example, there were three teachers in the seventh and eighth grade and we'd get them subs for a day and we'd gather them together and they would come with their drafts of the rubrics that they had written and, and they and uh, associate principal and I would sit down and the five of us would go through those rubrics line by line and we would challenge and ask them 
you know, well, what does that mean? Um, an attention grabbing introduction. That was a great one that came up with the seventh and eighth grade teachers. And, you know, I remember they kind of looked at each other and they weren't really sure what they meant when they said an attention grabbing introduction. That was one of the elements that they had in their rubrics. And then they started volunteering different ideas and talking about it. And as they talked and shared, they started to really coalesce around two or three things that they wanted or they expected or that they really meant when they said an attention grabbing introduction. I still remember it's, it includes an anecdote, a quote, um, and, uh, and having something like that as examples in the rubric helps students understand, or a fact, I think it was a fact, an anecdote or a quote um, that they wanted to have in their attention grabbing introduction. And through that conversation too, the teachers would say things like, well, I kind of feel like I'm giving away the answers to the kids, you know, with this, it's, I'm telling them too much. And I remember we said, well, you know, isn't that just really what good teaching is that, you know, making it clear to kids what it is you want them to do and what it looks like when they demonstrate those skills or that knowledge. And, uh, and at the end of one of those PLC days, um, a teacher, one of our really, our great teachers, one of our best teachers said, not, I this really stuck with me. You know, now that I'm so clear about what it is I want my kids to learn and do, I better go back and make sure I'm teaching these things. And I thought that was really profound. Um, this is one of the best teachers that we have on our campus who was realizing that she hadn't really been clear to herself about what it is she wanted the kids to learn. And of course, if she wasn't clear for herself, she wasn't clear for her kids. Uh, and she knew that she could, um, she could, she could do it. Yeah. That, that is powerful. And we find that a lot, just the professional development aspect of this whole process, it sounds like has been valuable in and of itself. And then you extend it further that it's benefiting the kids, uh, you know, in a, in a major way. And the fact that you've seen these performance gains and you've even increased your performance gain over the state clearly says that, that this system isn't watering down the curriculum, isn't hurting it and everything. And in fact, if it's opening it up to more kids so that they better understand what's expected, they're more involved in their education, parents are better partners with us, that, that's just a huge win all the way around. And I like the way, I mean, when you take time like that and you say um, that you've sat down, you, you carved out time and a lot of principals I've worked with when I was a teacher would say, yeah, you're gonna work on this and go do it. The fact that you sat down with them I think sent the message that this is important to you. This is not something you're giving up because you were there, you were invested in the work. That, so I, I appreciate that. We have a, just a few minutes left and I wanna be very respectful of people's time because I'm sure we all have people waiting at our door right now, knocking or maybe even a student or two in the hallway that needs your attention. So we'll just close out and I wanna make sure, um, I did get a message for those of you wondering, it sounds like uh, Christy is in the middle of a windstorm wherever uh, she is out there in the Midwest and knocked down some lines. So uh, we had glad I had a plan B and our plan C set up. So I think she's she's lurking there as best she can, but it's wreaking havoc on her whole system over there with some downed lines. Um, as you know, we'll finish off. If you have further questions, please uh, don't hesitate, send them off to Christy, uh, who you got the webinar invite from. So you already have her email. Uh, she'll be happy to answer questions and do some follow-up if you like. I know, Steve, you said you're happy to share some of these materials yeah. that you put out for everybody. Thank you for that. Um, Steve, you are one of the co-founders of SmartScore, as am I. We started this together uh, along with Catherine um, nine years ago to, to really try and change the culture of a school, to say we, we didn't want this culture of, you know, can I bang erasers after class to get five points, so now I have an A in math. We really wanted to align that. And I'm just so impressed with how far it's come. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Jim. Thank you for uh, for uh, for doing all this with the interview. And I'm sure there'll be more questions that we will be able to send off to you later on and, and do some follow-up. Anything you'd want, like to end Great. with before we close off and say goodbye to everybody? No, I just appreciate everybody making time. Uh, and I hope that some of these ideas will resonate with folks. And I would love to see um, schools becoming more clear and explicit for kids uh, so that all kids can be successful learners. And I think that the, uh, there's some, hopefully some ideas here that people will take away and, and be able to incorporate into their buildings. But thank you. Yeah, just thanks for the opportunity. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your questions. Uh, be sure to send an email. She put her email address just in case in the Q&A for you all to see. So if you're interested in sending a follow-up question to Christy or Steve, feel free. And with that, we'll all let's just get back to our, our day already in progress. Have a wonderful week. And Rich, I'll ask you to stop broadcasting the webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you for watching. You can reach us at customercare at smartedsystems.com or visit our website at www.smartedsystems.org.